Of course, this, we didn't have to use bromine here. We could use chlorine or iodine as well. So we could get a chloronium or iodonium. Huh, that's weird. I haven't actually heard those names. I think, you, I think this would work with chlorine and iodine, but I've never heard anyone say chloronium. What's the handout say? Uh, the handout says this would work with bromine or chlorine. So I guess it wouldn't work with iodine. Not iodine. Uh, so I guess that would be a chloronium ion, although I haven't heard that term. Bromonium sounds a little bit better somehow. Yeah, so we can attack with a Br2 or a Cl2. All right, well, we're only halfway through. What's going to happen now? What would be a reasonable reaction to have happen now? So who's it reasonable to put in a tail here? Um, Is there anybody in our mix here that would the, be reasonable? The ion. Yeah, the Br minus. Uh -huh. And who do you think would be reasonable to put in a head? The positive bromine. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So you want to use this bromine as the electrophile, right? Now, it turns out that that's actually not how this works. I think we maybe talked about this a little bit before. Remember that if something has a positive charge and an incomplete octet, then it's an electrophile. But if something has a positive charge and a complete octet, then it's the atom it's connected to that's the electrophile. I think maybe we, we briefly talked about that, or maybe that was with somebody else. So. If something has a positive charge and an incomplete octet, then it acts like an electrophile. But if something has a positive charge and a complete octet, it can't really be an electrophile because it has a complete octet. It can't gain more electrons because it really already has a complete octet. So then it makes the thing that it's attached to into an electrophile. So positive charges either make the atom they're on into electrophiles or they make the atom they're adjacent to into an electrophile. If the atom that it's had the, has the positive charge is an incomplete octet, then it's the electrophile. But otherwise, it's the thing that's attached to it that's an electrophile. And then the arrows would look like this. The nucleophile would attack the Y, and then the X would leave. So in this case, this would be a good leaving group. After all, a positive charge also makes you into a good leaving group. A positive charge can make you a good leaving group or a good electrophile. Well, if you have an incomplete octet, the positive charge makes you into an electrophile. But if you have a complete octet, you can't really get attacked by a nucleophile because you have a complete octet. So then the positive charge just makes you into a good leaving group. And it makes the thing that you're attached to into an electrophile. So um, did I give you the reactivity handouts? You have that. It's a one page handout. The reactivity. That's it. So here at the top of the reactivity handout, we talk about what's the effect of negative and positive charges. Mm -hmm. So notice that if you have a positive charge on something with an incomplete octet, that makes it into an electrophile. But if you have a positive charge on something with a complete octet, that makes the thing it's connected to into the electrophile. Okay. Um, and then this is just the leaving group over here. And by the way, the only thing that you're going to see with a positive charge and an incomplete octet, I think, is carbocations. So the only time the positive charge makes the atom into an electrophile is for a carbocation. Otherwise, the positive charge actually just makes something into a good leaving group. And it makes the thing it's attached to into the electrophile. That actually is going to be an important principle for the whole rest of the course. So it's good to have that in your notes there. Positive charges either give you a good electrophile if you have an incomplete octet, or they give you a good leaving group attached to an electrophile if you have a complete octet. Say again? Positive charges give good electrophile. When they're on an atom with an incomplete octet, which basically means a carbocation. That's the only thing you're going to see with the positive charge and an incomplete octet. 
But if the positive charge is on an atom with a complete octet, well, it can't be an electron pile because it, it doesn't have any room for anybody to attack it. So then this is just a good leaving group, and the atom it's attached to is the electrophile. So this is what the arrows would look like in this case. That's what the handout is trying to say. Well, the bromine here has a complete octet. So it's a good leaving group. That's right. And it's the atom that's attached to it that's going to be the electrophile. Remember, the only time that the positive charge is going to be on something with an incomplete octet pretty much is carbocations. Well, the bromine is clearly not a carbocation. So who's the bromine going to attack here? It's going to attack one of the carbons attached to the bromine. It'll attack a carbon attached to the bromine. And you can see the bromine here is acting like a leaving group. It's not leaving the whole molecule, but it's going to leave this alpha carbon down here. The bromine is going to leave this carbon down here. Okay. So let's see if we can now, uh, so the, yeah, we're not going to attack the bromine directly because it already has a complete octet. Instead, we attack the atom that's connected to it. That's what our little rules over here tell us. So let's see if we can use the arrows here to draw the correct product. go through the rest of that together. First of all, what's going to happen to this bromine here? Well, the bromine is still pointing above. However, what, what's, the ge what's the geometry of this carbon here? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. And that looks like this. So this bromine leaving group over here should be pointing to the left, not to the right. A tetrahedral carbon has this type of arrangement with 109.5 bond angles. Remember, this angle here should be 109.5. So in your original picture, you had the bromine pointing over here, but that wouldn't be 109.5. Well, wait a second. Why was this bromine over here pointing in that direction? Only because it was forced to to form the cycle. It really doesn't like being here. This is a very strange ring. That's one reason why it's so easy for this bromine to attack over here. This bromine doesn't naturally like having this 60 degree bond angle over here. So as soon as we snap this bond, it relaxes into its normal position. So uh, this is hard for people to remember, but once the bromine has le left the cycle here, once we, uh, it's not forced to be pointing to the right to form the cyclic three-membered ring, it's going to relax into its normal position, which is to the left over here. So it gets the 109 bond angle. So that's going to be the other BR down here. The other bromine is coming in from below. That's right. Let's stop and talk about that. Would we expect this bromine to come in from above or from below? Uh, yeah, why, why doesn't above make sense? Because it's not where the arrow is pointing. Ah, now the arrows here don't really, are not really supposed to show you the geometry of the attack. The arrows only show you who, what the charges will be and what bonds are being formed. So this, it's possible this could still be attacking from above, but why would it make more sense for the bromine to attack from below here and not from above? Steric hindrance. Remember, our two big considerations are electronics and sterics. Well, here are the sterics. This bromine is blocking the front. Remember, the bromine is like the leaving group here. Well, the bromine is, blo is, blo is blocking the top side. So it makes sense for the second bromine to come in from below. But then, I think you were drawing the substituents like this, but this is not really what a tetrahedral carbon would look like. Since the bromine is coming in from below, it should push, push these substituents up. This is what a normal tetrahedral carbon looks like. Okay. Now there's a, approximately a 109.5 degree angle between the hydrogen and the methyl and the bromine as well. Remember that in reality, the hydrogen and the methyl are in the same region of space. We've only drawn them a little bit askew so we can see both of them. 
Okay, so there's a couple of geometry points here. This bromine should relax to the left when we break this bond, so we can get a normal 109.5 degree bond angle. And the other bromine is coming in from below, so it should push the substituents on its carbon up above.